Hey, welcome to Christmas at Discovery Church. Make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house this Christmas. Man, Merry Christmas, everybody. We're, we're so honored that you chose to include Discovery in your Christmas tradition and your Christmas experience this year. You could have been doing a lot of things, so it is an honor, man, to celebrate with you um, that Jesus is born. Amen. I love everything about Christmas. Those that know me you know, well know that I love, I love Christmas, man. And at the risk of like revealing just how corny I am and losing all street credit or whatever cool points that you guys have given me, I'm going to let you in on how much I just, I love Christmas, you guys. I start listening to Christmas music. Like it starts getting introduced into my playlist in September, y'all, Okay. <laughs> So, and that's just not, I'm not saying all of it, but a little bit, it's in there. You can't tell me you're going to, you can't listen to Christmas music and not get just a little bit happier. You just can't. We start like, like watching movies, uh, Christmas movies in November and we start checking them off our list and twice and thrice and all that stuff. We go back to them. We just love Christmas. And I don't know when it changed in my life. I don't know when like I started appreciating all these other things about Christmas because when I was young, it wasn't that way. When I was young, it was just about one thing. How many you know what it was? When we were young, what was it about? It was about the, that's what it was. It was about the presents. And we do the same thing with our kids that our parents did with us, that you've all kind of experienced. You ask your kids what they want. And, and so we're like, we do that. Since they're a little kid, you know, what do you want? It used to be just like verbal. They tell us what they want. And then they learn how to write and stuff. And so they, and, and it used to be, then it turned into this piece of paper with a crayon. And they give us this cute little list, you know what I mean? With like three or four things on it and just simple things, toys and stuff like that. Now, they got like Amazon shopping carts, you guys. And they give us lists with links. It's like, what's going on? on oh, here. This is out of control just a little bit. So this year as I was like preparing for my Christmas, which is, is much earlier than probably you guys, I'm preparing just, I, I enjoy, but I'm also preparing for this. I'm preparing for our Christmas experience. And, and I just felt like, man, I, when, when we and Veronica started talking about what do we want for Christmas, because we do it as well, which you guys probably do, and what do you want, and whether dropping hints or giving a list, you know, we, we do that. We do all of it, lists and hints, okay? And, and this year, I was like, when she asked me, I was just like, you know what, honey? I'm good. Uh, I don't, uh, and when I said that, it wasn't like, don't give me any presents. She knew what I was talking about, okay? I want some presents on Christmas. I want to open up some presents on Christmas, but I was like, baby, I'm good. Like, like you just give me whatever you, whatever you want to give me this year. I just, I, I, I didn't want, I wanted to make this Christmas about giving, I, and, and I just feel like sometimes, and, and maybe, maybe you've cut, been caught up in this, I know I have at times, that we can, we can like celebrate the true meaning of Christmas in here, in this place, where it's like, it's singing the songs and worship and we're reading scriptures and we're just like, we're, we're reminded of it and here we can celebrate the true meaning of Christmas. But I have a feeling out there, we're not celebrating Christmas, we're celebrating gift miss. You know what I mean? It's just, it's like, it's all about that. And I'm not, don't get me wrong, like I love to give gifts, <laughs> I like to receive gifts, um, I like, I, I love to give, in, like, I love the look of my kid's face. Do you, like, do you love when you've given an intentional gift? Maybe it's not something you don't have kids, but you put thought, intentionality into a gift, and, and the look on their face, isn't that cool? Does anyone know the joy of giving here, okay? That the, the look on their face is just like, it's priceless. It makes you just feel so, it feels great. I love giving my kids gifts now, but how many of you also know the feeling of disappointment when they do not express the way that you thought they should express? <laughs> and then you have this thought, well, give it back then. You don't say it, you think it, because you're a Christian, you know what I mean? You're, you're trying to be a good person. You're like, I'll rewrap that thing and give it to somebody who wants it. You're like, keep it myself. I want you to imagine with me, imagine God with great excitement giving us the gift of Jesus. And then some people going, well, that's not on my list. Well, that's not what I was thinking about. That's not what I want. And then there's others that go, this is the greatest gift that I've ever received in my entire life. He is the gift that truly just keeps on giving. He, he's the gift that like, like is no batteries are needed, okay? There is no software update after opening. Can I get an amen? You guys know what I'm talking about, you guys? This gift, he's, he's, it's timeless and relevant and valuable and worth giving your life to and I had this thought as I was preparing for my Christmas and our Christmas at Discovery experience months ago. I had this thought, maybe you had it before, that, that Christmas is the only birthday party where we 
get the gifts. You ever thought about that? Like it's his birth that we are celebrating, yet the way that we celebrate it, everybody else, including us, is getting the gifts. And I just always thought like, like why? What about, why? wouldn't it be great? Like the best way to celebrate Christmas would be to give Jesus some gifts because it's birthday. It's, it's really, it's really, it's not about me. Look, it's, I mean, it's not about my kids. And I want them to have a great Christmas experience every year. I really do, but it's not about them. And it's not about me. And I think, I think that in all like the commercialism that we just live in in our culture around Christmas, I, I think it's easily forgotten. And so today, what I think, this Christmas, what I think would be appropriate is if we give Jesus some presents today, what if we just kind of intentionally, like we, you do it for so many other people, what if we were intentional with giving Jesus some presents this Christmas. So here's the question I want to answer with you guys today. What gifts can we bring to King? Like really, think about it. like he's he's King. He's he's the King of Kings. He created all things and was before all things and gave all things meaning. He created me. He's the beginning and the end. So what in the world do I have to offer? When you talk about giving gifts to a king or the king of kings, what does that even look like? So to help us answer this question, because today this is, I want to help lead you to, to make Christmas different this year, where we're intentional in what we're bringing and giving to Jesus. To help us do this, we're going to study a beautiful story in the Christmas story in the Bible, the story of these wise men, those three magi, the three kings, if you will. It's, it's found in the book of, of Matthew, and I love Matthew. Matthew is my favorite gospel. In the book of Matthew, he gives more real estate, more time and attention to these wise men than he does to even the birth of Jesus himself. It's a great story, but I hate to bust your bubble, okay? Um, there probably weren't three of them. There were three gifts, and we're going to study these gifts today to help us out. There were three gifts and so because there were three gifts, it was just associated maybe three. But, but most theologians believe that there was probably a multitude of, of wise men and magi because that's how they traveled back then in a caravan, in a, in a large group. And I hate to bust your bubble again, but they weren't even there in the manger scene. They weren't. They showed up in Jesus' life about two years later. Now, don't go home and remove them from your nativity scene from ever. Y'all like, you guys, liars, you're not there. This is cancel wise man. No, don't do that. It's not because they're, they're a great part of the journey in this whole Christmas experience. They, they really are. Probably around Je when Jesus was about two years old, just before him and his family would flee to Egypt. If you remember the story, King Herod was trying to kill all the babies in Israel because, because there was this prophetic word that was given. And at the time it was given, he would have been about this age. And, and he knew that this Messiah, the king of the Jews, the king of Israel, would be born. And he thought that this king would be a threat to his kingship. And he didn't realize that Jesus was not coming to be like, a, like a, a king of any land. He was coming to be a heavenly king. So these, this was a family, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, they, they had to flee. But right before they did that, these magi were traveling. And you know the story. They're following a star. These guys are astrologers. That's what they are. They're pagan priests looking for something but check this out you guys they didn't even know what they were looking for they just knew something is out there there's got to be more to this and i don't even know i don't even know what it is but i'm hungry for more something and that kind of some of you can sympathize with that feeling because you've been searching in your life for something and you may not even know really what you're searching for but you just know there's got to be something more out there you're even hungry for something. You just don't even know really what you're hungry for. Let's go to this story in Matthew chapter 2 and starting at verse 1. It starts with these first three words, Jesus was born. Can we this Christmas just say those three words together? One, two, three. Jesus was born. Let me just pause right there in this moment. Can we still appreciate this, that, that on a real day, in, uh, in real history, in a real city, in, in, in Bethlehem, in Judea, in this real world, God himself came to take away all guilt, to fulfill all hope, and to defeat all enemies. That this was a day planned before 
eternity, before the creation of the world with the whole universe, you guys, with the untold light years of space and the billions of galaxies, they were created and they were made glorious for this day when Emmanuel, God with us, would come. This is amazing. This is why, not in your notes, but the angel Gabriel, remember when he's making that announcement to the shepherds of the field, he says this in Luke 2, do not be afraid, I bring you good news. This is good news. Jesus is born, and it'll cause great joy for all people. Let me ask you something. Are you having joy this season? Are you experiencing? Some of you guys are just, yes, yes, I'm experiencing joy. But there may be some of you here that, that it's hard to even answer that question. Can I tell you something? Your joy this season is in direct relation to what you are seeking. Let me say that again. Your joy this season is in direct relation to what you are seeking. So I want you to ask yourself this question. What is it I want to get out of Christmas? What is it that is going to give me this, like, make Christmas wonderful and satisfying? Is it snow? Is that what's going to do for you? Or or is it all the family together and getting along and happy? Is that what's going to make this season? Is that what you're you're seeking this Christmas? Or maybe was it the present, the right present, the one you've been hinting for that that you were hoping? Did you get it and did it fulfill all your Christmas wishes? Did you not get it and did it leave you? Like, see, all these things, you guys, the problem with all these things is that they can leave us disappointed. And I don't know if you've ever had that kind of Christmas experience where after Christmas, you kind of were disappointed because it didn't deliver what you thought it it would. Well, the problem isn't Christmas, it's with your expectation. It's, it's, It's we're seeking the wrong things. And so if we go back to this story, Matthew chapter two, these magi show us, if you're not experiencing joy in this season, it's a reflection of what you are seeking. And these guys were seeking the right thing. Matthew chapter two, verse one, let me go back to it. Jesus was born. In a real city, in this real world, he came, in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, here's what they were seeking, where, where is he, where is this newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. They actually end up at King Herod's palace, and they just were trying to get some help to to find this this, this king, and, and, and Herod um, he actually tries to trick them in telling him when they find him because he actually wanted to, you know, kill him. And so they, they get discernment on it, just kind of pick up on like, this is the, he's up to no good here. So the Bible says that these wise men went on their way. But, but it, what's not kind of inherent in the text of the scripture as we read it with, as they went on their way, like we know that they actually traveled for about two more years. It wasn't a quick thing. So they didn't just show up in the manger scene, right, with the shepherds and the stars shining. That wasn't the scene. They traveled, get this, for over a 1,000 miles over the course of two years looking for, searching for this king and the star that they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy, and they entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts, which I think is appropriate on Christmas, right? The gifts that they gave were, were, I don't know, I don't think they knew what they were doing with it, but they fit so beautifully in the narrative of God's prophetic journey from the beginning of time of who this baby would be, who this this newborn king would be. Let me show you. It's a, you've, got, you've got some notes, that, that it, some handouts. If you want to take some notes, this is what each one of those gifts actually represent. The gold. The gold represented a gift that you would give a king, and that spoke to the royalty of Jesus. The frankincense. What it, frankincense was, would be burned as incense to, in the worship of of deity that reflects Jesus, deity, and myrrh. Myrrh is actually a burial spice that relates to his humanity. So how did these guys know? These are people, pagan priests, astrologers who did not have the law, did not have the Torah, did not have the prophets, did not. How did they know that within their gifts they were foretelling the life of Jesus in his royalty, his deity, and his humanity? Now, as we talk about like 
what gifts could we bring a king? Some of y'all are probably thinking, I ain't got no gold today, Pastor, to give. <laughs> like, and I, you're, you might be thinking, like, I, I ain't got no myrrh. I don't know what a myrrh is, but I know I don't have a myrrh. I ain't got no myrrh up in here. So what can we do? There's three things, three things that you probably missed in the story that these wise men gave to Jesus. Three things that they gave him that every one of us can give as a, as a present this Christmas to Jesus. Let me say it this way. What could we give a king? Like if Jesus made a Christmas list, if he made a list, I mean, what is, like he has everything. He owns it all. I'll tell you this. These three things would be on Jesus' list. There are three things, even if you sit here today and you're like, I don't really have anything to offer. I ain't got nothing to give. No, you do. You do have something to give and something to offer. And get this, Jesus actually wants it. He wants it. Well, what is it? What, what are the three gifts that I'd love to encourage you to give Jesus this year? Here's the first one I think we can give. We can give God our hope. We can give him our hope. You remember in the story, it says we, that these wise men, they said, we saw the star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Well, when do stars appear? They appear in the darkness of, of night, and that's the, one of the beauties of Christmas is that it's in the darkest time and season of the year, and that's on purpose. That's intentional. December is where the winter solstice is, where there is the darkest days, like Christmas. Every year, Christmas is a reminder that Jesus came into the darkest part of our night, into the darkest part of our life. In John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And I would submit to you that when it gets dark in your life, you have a choice to make. You can either follow that darkness, or you can follow the light. And what hope is, hope says, I'm in a, okay, I'm in a dark time in my, my life, and I'm confused, and I'm concerned, and, and I'm overwhelmed, and it's dark, and God, you're even, you're, you're even doing things and acting in ways that I don't get, and I wouldn't even do that if I was God, man. I, but I, I'm, I, it's dark, but I'm going to trust you anyway. And there is right now, I believe right now, there is at work a spirit of darkness in this world. And there always has been at work, I guess, the enemy in this darkness, but more than ever, like that I've ever seen in my life, in my years of ministry, there is a, a specific and targeted attack, I believe, not just in the world, but on the people of God, a spirit of fear, a spirit of anxiety, a spirit of panic, like I've never seen. And I believe it is a specific targeted attack on our generation that the enemy is, and it's the reason why. We're just coming out of here at Discovery. I taught a six-week series on perfect peace, how God, God can give you peace in the middle of it. Like peace is not the absence of any darkness, any problems. It's the presence of God in the middle of them. Here's why. Some of us have given up hope. It got too dark. It got too hard. It took too long, and we just kind of gave up on God, on our on our, on our faith, and here's, here's a gift that you can give Jesus this year. You can give him your hope again. And, and this, listen to what God says. God says this in Isaiah chapter 49. Those who hope in who? He says in, in me <laughs> will not be disappointed. See, the problem is we're putting our hope in all the wrong things. We're putting our hope in people like, oh, okay, this is the one. This is the one. Oh, this is the time, and this is the thing, and this is the situation. And God's like, of course you're getting disappointed. All this world will fail you. People are going to fail you. Things are going to fail you. Jobs will fail you. Money will fail you. Your health will fail you. Everything will fail you because this world is fallen and broken. But God says, put your hope in me, and I'll never let you down. He will never let you down. And, and, and hope, put your hope in me. He says, you will not be disappointed. That word disappointed is actually, it's, it's dis and appointed. It means this, that we thought there was an appointed something for us. I thought it was appointed to me to stay married. I thought, I thought, you know, I thought it was appointed to me that my kids would. And I thought it was appointed to me that, that this would be the year, but it didn't happen. So we lost hope. We got disappointed appointed and God is going like of course you're disappointed you can't get hope there but when you put your hope in me you'll never be disappointed and a very beautiful transaction takes place that that you would experience this Christmas if you actually gave God your hope if you gave him that present today of your hope a, a transaction a spiritual transference and transaction happens 
when you do, that's explained in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Let me show it to you. Romans chapter 15, 13 shows us what happens. It says this, may the God, look what he called. he's called the God of hope. That's who he is. He's the God of hope. Here's what he wants to do. He wants to fill you with all joy and all peace as you trust in him. So God, it's hard and it's dark and it's difficult and, I got, and I'm overwhelmed, but I'm gonna choose to trust in you anyway when you do that so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's what that scripture said. The moment that you choose to put your trust in him, to give him your hope, it says this, that not only will God give you joy and peace, but he wants to overflow his hope inside your life. Wait a minute, is it my hope or is it his hope? Am I supposed to give him hope or is he gonna give me hope? I don't, I don't understand. No, here's, here's what you need to see. You're not held by your hope, you're held by his the moment, the moment, and there's a bunch of these transferences that actually happen, these spiritual, supernatural transferences that take place. It's like when we love God, he fills us with a supernatural love. It's a transaction. I'm going to put my heart, I'm going to choose to love you, and God does something miraculous on, this, on the inside. When you choose to put your faith in God, he then puts a faith inside of you that can move mountains. It's a transaction that, that takes place when you choose and, and by the way, when you choose to withhold your hope, say if this was a gift that you're, it's too dark, and you're like, no, I just can't do it. I can't put my trust, I can't put my hope. What you're literally doing is distancing and removing yourself from the God of hope. It, it's who he is. That's who he is. He is the God of hope. And he deserves it because he's faithful. He's trustworthy. He never lets us down. So this year, this year, man, I'm not just going to focus on giving my kids a gift and, and me getting some of the right gifts. I'm going to give God. I'm going to give Jesus his birthday. I'm going to give him some gifts. I'm going to give him my hope. Here's the second thing I want us to give him. We can give God our fervent pursuit. And I added the word fervent in there because it's like, remember what they said. These, it said the wise men went on their way, and it wasn't just like a, a, a meandering over to the home and finding them. It was a two-year journey. It was a thousand miles. It was like, no, no, no. We're going to, I'm going to keep pursuing. Oh, Herod doesn't want us to find him. I don't matter. I'm going to, so this is that pursuit that says, I'm never going to stop pursuing you, God. I'm never going to stop because there's more. You got, there's more knowledge. There's more understanding. There is more gifting. There is more anointing. There is more love. There is more grace. There's, and I'm still going to open up my word after 25 years of studying the Bible, expecting for fresh life, for fresh revelation, for God to reveal things in me that he has not yet, for God to reveal things in my life that haven't even happened yet. I'm going to come to God still with expectation in his word, and I'm going to pursue him through his word. I'm going to come to church. Not like it's my religious kind of check-in, it's Sunday thing, but I'm coming in here pursuing an encounter with the living God. See, some of us say hey, we've gotten a little bit maybe comfortable in the, in a, the version of Christianity that you're playing, the, the, the religious thing that we're doing here. And this is a gift that we can give God. We can give him back our, our pursuit Jesus said this in John chapter 4, that a time is coming and has actually now come when true worshipers, they worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And then he says this, these are the kind of worshipers that God is actually seeking for. God is looking for people who are pursuing him and who, who love him. He says in Jeremiah 29 that you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. See, I think that this Christmas we can exchange the passive religious model that we have adopted and exchange it for a passionate pursuit. Because God, God wants us to actively pursue him. And something has gotten in the way of your pursuit. Something has gotten in the way of your passion. Something has gotten in the way of maybe even your quiet time. Do you remember when you used to, when you used to just sit in silence with him over the word or in prayer and and you enjoyed, and you, you talked to him. You actually talked, and, and, and you, you laid your burdens on him, and, and you experienced the peace and the presence of God. Do you remember the pursuit? This year, we can give God, 
well, I don't have anything to give. What do I have? To? I think that, that thought and that kind of mentality is like, it keeps so many people maybe from even doing anything and offering anything and approaching God because he's, he's king. What do I have? He's a, he owns it all. No, he actually wants this from you. He actually would love if he had a list, these would be on it. He wants your hope. He wants your pursuit. And then here's number three. I think we can also give God our worship. Here's what the wise men did. They bowed down and worshiped him. Now, this is a gift. Listen to me. This is a gift. Nobody can give this for you. This team cannot worship God for you. Just because you sit, you sat in a worship experience did not, does not mean that you encountered worship. Just because you listened to worship does not mean that you worshiped. And I'm not even talking about like the 20-minute the kind of worship experience type of deal on a church service like at Discovery or something. I'm talking about something so much more beautiful, something so much more powerful that we can actually give God that he wants. It's on his list. You really want to know like what's on Jesus Christmas list, like his birthday. What's on his list? We want to see like what, let's get, this is what's on his list. Mark chapter 12. Here is what's on. If you had a list, this would be it. Mark chapter 12. It says this. One of the teachers of the law came and heard Jesus debating with some people and noticing Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked them of all the commandments, which is most important to you, God? Like, what's the most important thing to you? What do you want most? Well, the most important one, Jesus said, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love. The Lord's your God. Here's what he wants. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. You know, guys, how we worship God matters. How we love God matters. God is not very interested in the passive, the passive without heart worship. In fact, it's not even worship, is it? Without, like, it's not love unless it, has your, unless it has our heart. If I tried to love my wife without my heart, if I tried to love my wife without my soul, the way that some of us try to love God, I mean, you know, it, <laughs> that wouldn't be a healthy marriage. Like, if I tried to love on God the way with your hands in your pocket, I think she's sitting up there. Hi, hey, honey. She's in the dark right now, I think. Hey, man. Yeah, yeah, I love you. You know that. I mean, you know, that's not, she ain't going to feel that love, right? What she, what she wants is she wants to feel, like, my affection. She wants to feel my heart. She wants to feel my arms around her. Right? She wants to feel my, my kiss. She wants to feel, I'll stop right there because I see kids in the room and stuff. But, but she wants to feel the affection of her husband, man. That's a healthy marriage, right? That's a healthy, where you're giving the love. And, and, and this is what God, God's seeking. He's actually seeking people that love him. He's seeking people that, that want to, he wants your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. This is, this is his list. This is his list. This is what Jesus said. This is what's most important to me. Here's my list. I want, here, it's, your, it's your hope. It's your, your pursuit. It's your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, your worship. And I think this Christmas, maybe you've opened up all the presents or maybe you're, going to open up some more and stuff, and all that stuff is great. I mean, I mean, let's keep those things. I'm all for it, man. Let's sing some those songs. Let's, let's watch the movies. Let's give the gifts. Let's receive the gifts. Let's eat the food. Let's give him some gifts. Let's give Jesus. It's his birthday. It's what we're celebrating. Let's be intentional in what we're offering. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.